Thanks for in inviting me. I'm here to talk about OpenStack and our experiences at Indiana University for Jetstream, which is a National Science Foundation project. I'm going to tag team between myself and Mike Lowe this morning. So hopefully we'll be able to address any questions, uh, concerns you may have. We've been involved since uh, uh, writing the project through acquisition and implementation. And now we're just about at the end of uh, year one operations. Just to give a brief, um, a brief overview, we're going to start, uh, as in the mountains, we're going to start high, a uh, little, little higher than, uh, than the mountains here. And um, uh, along the way, we'll pass some cows, uh, some dragons. So you guys have to pay attention this morning. I know uh, everybody's tired. Spend all of your fake money at the casino. And uh, so as, as you do have questions, feel free to interject and, uh, and let us know. The, um, the name Jetstream really comes from a dividing, uh, a dividing line. So as we talk about the project, we think about a division uh, of air masses, which is what the Jetstream is. But we're dividing traditional HPC infrastructure and cloud infrastructure and trying to bring those, those users. Background on IU, uh, you may not be that familiar with Indiana University. If you look, there's a state of Indiana. Up here is Lake Michigan, uh, Chicago. So uh, that puts you in perspective. Square in the Midwest. We have eight campuses and nine medical schools, medical st centers. And we're partners with um, IU Health the largest healthcare provider in the state. So we see, um, not necessarily for this project, but we see both traditional IT of a large research university as well as doctors, researchers in the medical sciences. So presents uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunity. An overview of what, um, who goes to IU, if you're here from, from Europe, you may not recognize it from any other university, but it's, uh, it's quite, quite large, 114,000 students in the system this past year, uh, nearly 20,000 staff and faculty. All of those people are, are customers in one way or another. Our IT shop are, are, is centralized across all those campuses, and we're able to uh, participate as a, a research division from within our, our central IT organization, which is a little different than many universities, institutions, where it may be a completely separate entity. Presents some challenges, but also opportunities. IU overall um, is a, a $3 billion institution, and last year, uh, over $600 million in grant awards. So research funding and that, that research life cycle is just an ever continuing and, and has traditionally been a, a growing opportunity. So you, you've talked about um, a few of the uh, National Science Foundation systems. They've kind of been uh, sprinkled amongst some of the talks. Uh, you heard uh, Torsten talk a little bit about uh, Blue Waters and his involvement there. He, uh, he, didn't, he didn't mention that he got his PhD at IU and uh, we worked with him when he was a, a young lad. Uh, and he's been he's been great. Uh, we love uh, love Torsten and, and DK mentioned uh, a little bit about uh, some of the other systems like Chameleon and um, that's all part of a centralized infrastructure at the at the NSF that's collaborated through uh, something called the Exceed Project, the Extreme uh, Science and Engineering Discovery Environment. They're kind of the glue that ties together these allocations at a at a large scale and. There's also various programs where resources are acquired. So Blue Waters was under, under one of these track one programs at the NSF. Systems like Stampede and Comet, which you may have heard about now. Stampede 2 are, are track two systems, um, uh, smaller awards in Blue Waters. And you have some cloud test beds as well, like uh, Chameleon and uh, Cloud Lab, which are focused on kind of the research into clouds themselves computer science project. The most recent award brought us uh, Jetstream as well as Bridges. Uh, Bridges is, is not 
quite a traditional cloud environment, but they are using uh, uh, OpenStack underneath to bring you know, some of the cluster and cloud functionality together. When we debated what we should do on, uh, on Jetstream, we decided to go with a pure, pure cloud approach from the perspective of there's so much demand for, for clusters and traditional um, HPC resources in Exceed. It's always over requested that if we let all those people take on the system from day one, it would be overwhelmed. And the, uh, the users that, that are new that we're trying to reach would not be reached. There's other projects that we're, um, we're involved in as well. Uh, we host uh, part of the, or half the system for Wrangler, a large uh, storage project within the, the NSF with our partners at TAC. And um, we play small roles in things like, uh, things like Comet, uh, minor partner on things like Blue Water. So a lot of these uh, sites and systems interoperate and, and work, work together. It is, it is a competition at one level, but there's also uh, a great degree of collaboration and, and learning. Been particularly important with, with the, uh, the open. So as we put together and, and set out, what are we trying to do? Who are we trying to reach from a project perspective? The goal was really to expand and reach those users that the National Science Foundation funds, but they're not currently using Exceed resources. So if you look there, uh, less than 2% of those researchers that receive some support from the NSF, over 300,000 people, um, had actually executed a job on a system like Blue Water, Stampede, et cetera. And what's even, even more telling is uh, Dave Lifka at Cornell did a, a cloud survey a couple years ago. And 70% of those people surveyed claim to be resource constrained. Well, if you're resource constrained in some way and you're not already running on the existing infrastructure, you have to come to the conclusion that there's some barriers to access. Um, those barriers could be the ease of, ease of use, ease of access, uh, getting an allocation on the system, can be um, difficult, time-consuming if you're, if you're new to it. Um, the HPC resources that are there may or may not be well-matched for um, what you're trying to do. And, and lastly, maybe they don't need that much uh, capacity capability. They probably have some local resources. They may have a desire to use something not at their institution, but may not have the, the time uh, doing the cost-benefit analysis to say, I don't need that much, that much more than, than what I have. We've, we've touched on some of that this week where you have um, engineers and, and other teams which are working in the lab environment or working in a workstation environment, but they don't have the motivation, the time, the tools to move up to a large traditional HPC system. So those are the people we're, we're trying to uh, target with Jetstream. So what is it? We've talked a little bit about this. It's a production cloud facility. We're aiming to uh, not do research into cloud environments, but provide a cloud environment for domain scientists, which at the time uh, was certainly um, uh, interesting. And as, as we looked at, uh, at the start of the proposal, the real question was, can this be done? And can it be done with OpenStack today? And um, yeah. It wasn't assured that, that that was the case, but it, it has been done and, and has worked quite well. So we're trying to provide on-demand resources, configurable environments, and users can select the, the images they want to run. It is a virtualized environment in our, in our case, and we'll dive a little more into the... So what is, what is it really? Um, it's, uh, it's a... Look, Collection of cows um, is, uh, is is what we're what we're terming it. These uh, these these researchers uh, want to come in and, and run their um, run their virtual machines, and we want them to come, stay a while, and then go away. They're they're not there to to be there forever. Um, and the real difference is it's programmable cyber infrastructure. And what what I mean by that is the the system, the, the resources, the hardware uh, becomes less in this equation. So less important, not necessarily less scale or less expensive, 
um, but it's not the focus. The software on the other side is more important. Uh, the programmability, uh, APIs, and access mechanisms are more important. And when people think of clouds, they may think inherently of virtual machines, but it's, it's more than that. It's um, a different way of interacting with, with these environments. So you know, we're focused on that commodity infrastructure and robust software, not that uh, HPC systems and software are not robust, but the focus is different. Um, thinking about um, the loaded or unloaded term co-design and how you know, you're digging at the, the very low level. We've talked about FPGAs and how, how deep you're in and, and why there may not be some success in those environments yet because of that programmability. But that's, that's deep in the hardware mechanism where what we're looking at from, from this cloud perspective is, is at that higher level and software that's just so, so quickly, uh, quickly evolving. Doesn't mean we don't host persistent services. That's an important part of our equation, as is um, reproducibility. And uh, we're providing that, being, being able to uh, archive these, these VMs, give them DOIs, so people can come back and, and reference them. That goes into um, our uh, scholarly data archive, which runs on HPSS, an environment that's been around since 1999, and we have it around for a long time. So who's using it today? Uh, mostly researchers that, that are in a domain but don't need a ton of resources. These are, are largely single node jobs, not that we don't support uh, multi-node workloads, but it's not really our design point. And um, we also have people that, uh, that want to create their own environments and send them to others, customize. You know, not just here's this package you can install on your system, but here's this whole environment that's already up and running. You can just launch it, log in, and test. This works great for these uh, science gateways. It also is, has been uh, really useful in the education section where you're trying to, this can be undergraduates, this can be graduate students, this can be um, a, a large uh, a MOOC or something like that, for example, where you don't, you don't have the time to walk people through the entire process of installing the software. You're trying to teach them about data sciences or you're trying to teach them about curation or, or whatever. And you want that environment already set up and configured and be able to go. And it, it is a different set of, of, of people, not the usual suspects. We have, uh, we have some commercial software available in limited form. MATLAB uh, was finally licensed and, and they've kind of changed their approach recently, which your center may or may not have already encountered. Uh, it's been good for this project. Um, we have the MATLAB and the, the first uh, 52 cool toolkits available, things like Intel compilers as well. But people can bring their own, um, their own licensed software if they want and uh, important for people in, in Lots of these environments that are, that are both learning or want to distribute these type of software. So we're not quite at the, the end of our first year of operations, but we're getting close. In that time, we've served over 290 active projects, over 1,500 uh, active users from 165 institutions. And you look and say, well, you know, there's only like 12 science gateways. What do those represent? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, also, the educational allocations. I think that that number is, uh, is probably low. We've had individual uh, uh, courses where there have been over 200 students uh, interacting with the system simultaneously. We've done a lot of learning in that process and uh, have, have both improved the environment and improved the, the way to do that for, um, for instruction. We're averaging just over 600 uh, concurrent VMs, and that's climbing uh, gradually each month with uh, over 99% availability. And going back to who our audience is, I think my favorite point is 20% of these users are completely new to the NSF Exceed environment. They had not used any other system or resource 
or had even a, a web portal account. That's what we're, we're trying to go after, and that's the, the environment we're trying to provide. So those, those gateways are really proxies for lots of other users. And the, we've targeted a number of, of different domain-specific gateways, or they've come to us with needs where they can't be hosted or um, need bursting capability. We'll, um, we'll dive into one of those more specifically. It's things like um, Iris that we're working with uh, for um, geographic seismic data. Um, they're trying to use multiple exceed resources, things like Wrangler uh, storage, which is a luster-based system, uh, in concert with um, Jetstream as well. Presents some, some unique challenges. Um, a, uh, a project, uh, an open medical records project from Indiana, which we've worked with for a long time, is trying to find their, their home on, on Jetstream. And then you, you have the uh, traditional users as well, these uh, molecular dynamic users. Been working with uh, Dr. Emory Brooks of Texas, and he's, um, he's focused on pr making MD easy to use um, at a, a modest scale for researchers, has a gateway to do that, and has been, um, as other resources are, uh, um, are short, being able to move people to Jetstream and use that gateway, run their MD simulations on the back end without uh, a need necessarily for command line driven operation. So one of the highlight projects and, and gateways is, is Galaxy. I don't know if you've heard of Galaxy. It's focused on, on bioinformatics. All those uh, lovely codes that are, are often written in scripted languages. There's a, there's a portal um, that uh, you can go to, use galaxy.org. It has over 100,000 registered users, 300,000 uh, jobs running each. I, I can pretty much bet that, that most people on their HPC cluster don't have 100,000 or haven't even, even in the, the life of their center. So when you're able to support these type of interactions, you can reach to a much broader community. They're using Jetstream in multiple ways. They both um, uh, use it as a bursting platform. So they have the, the main uh, usegalaxy.org. And on the back end, on the API side of Jetstream, can provision additional resources inside. Uh, Slurm for batch management. Within, um, within their project. So you know, they have sort of a traditional approach in a cloud environment to their bursting. But then they also want to say, here's your, your individual uh, Galaxy instance. If you want to customize what's in Galaxy, if you want to learn what it's about, how to run it, um, you can stand up your own instance, your own web portal. It's all, all to yourself, um, and you can use that as a proxy to, to other users. Since we've kicked this off last year, we have over uh, 8,000 users that have used Jetstream by way of a Galaxy and over 115,000 jobs. So we, we had to take the time and be able to support these, uh, this team in an integrated way, but it provides quite an immediate benefit. And even that is, is more than most, most people have on their HP. And this is just one example of one domain community. We're trying to support a number of these in, in deep and, and critical ways. I talked about the uh, educational aspect. I won't hit on that um, uh, too hard, but there, there are you know, different classes, whether it's um, somebody um, on the Blue Waters team came to us and wanted to do a workflow workshop, uh, the Research Data Alliance. We have a um, uh, professor who's trying to do um, research into vulnerabilities and, and being able to, uh, to stand up systems and secure them and teach about system security, um, something that's well suited for, um, uh, for this environment. And then uh, as we kind of move, uh, move a little closer into that closer view of the, of the system, there are different layers with it. We have um, at the top, uh, 
what we call Atmosphere, which is from the University of Arizona. It's the web portal that sits on top of OpenStack for our front, front end users, uh, that interactive environment. We, um, we, then move in <clears throat> we then move into the OpenStack services and um, uh, have two independent resources um, and clouds there underneath running KVM as their hypervisor. Underneath that really sits Ceph, which is the underpinning of all we need to provide for those OpenStack services, providing storage for uh, Glance, Cinder, as well as um, S3, Swift-style uh, object storage. Uh, OS-wise, primarily uh, uh, CentOS and Ubuntu. We're starting to play with Windows. We've had a number of requests, and it's challenging in multiple ways, not the, not the least of which is. And then uh, at the application layer, those, those applications that people are bundling, putting together, trying to, uh, trying to serve. What this really looks like is, is users can have multiple touch points into the system. They can come in and they may just be interacting with this um, web portal with Atmos. And if all they're doing is, is managing a handful of virtual machines, wanting to, to launch, image, customize those, that's what they can do in that environment. If they want to control those resources from an API. Atmosphere does have a Agave API that they can, they can interact with. But um, what, we, what we had planned for much later in the project, not, not even to start till project, but I think we launched this within a couple months of bringing the system online, was directly exposing the OpenStack APIs. There are so many tools and so many people that are already doing this today that um, we've, we've had a lot of demand for that. That's where the persistent gateways where you can hold on to your, your floating IPs, for example, all of that happens at the OpenStack layer. And when you're doing that, you're interacting directly with uh, one of the, uh, the cloud environments. You're not, um, you're not interacting with a higher level. So it's uh, going to be very similar to you know, running in different regions of a commercial cloud. You have to be intentional about where you're running your resources, how you're managing those those resources. And then the Ceph environments are a part of, uh, of each of those sites. As kind of how it's, it's divided up and connected, it's connected through Exceed and ExceedNet, uh, but also through Internet 2. Um, there's just a little over uh, 300 nodes at each of the primary sites here, about a, uh, a petabyte of storage. And then here at, at Arizona, there's a small test environment what we, uh, what we typically do, and, and Mike can dive into this a little bit more, but that test environment is, is really used for uh, testing the web applications and, and atmosphere and making sure the interoperability is, is there um, as OpenStack is, is changing constantly. And if you don't keep up, you're gonna get in a state where you're paralyzed and, and uh, feel like you can't. Then we're also able to, say, upgrade the um, the IU cloud, which we've done multiple times at this point. And Mike uh, walks, uh, walks through that in a few minutes and can keep the other cloud static. If there are issues, we can roll back or we can wait and try to uh, get a fix for um, whatever, uh, whatever surprise uh, comes, with the, comes with the latest release. The, the hardware is divided into kind of different classes. We have mostly, um, mostly Dell blades commodity equipment as part of it. You know, those, those are compute hosts and um, uh, run OpenStack services. And we have uh, standalone systems where we want to use those for cluster management, for HA nodes, for load balancing, hosting databases, hosting uh, uh, message queuing services like RabbitMQ, which you know, those type of things are, are really critical to uh, the infrastructure. and. Honestly, that's, uh, that's what's going to go wrong a lot of times as well. Um, then uh, we have uh, dedicated systems with direct attached storage that, that Ceph runs on. Had a lot of discussions this week about integrating this with existing storage environments. Uh, we do have GPFS and Luster at our site, but this system is completely externally focused. So um, we're trying some of that integration with uh, 
Wrangler, the Luster system for for Exceed, but we're not doing that integration with our own local storage. It's not part of what we're providing to this user. And then uh, at a switch level, we're using uh, these Dell Force 10 S6000 switches. These are, uh, these are all 40 gig switches. The individual hosts are connected, uh, bonded. We have a, a pretty set and, and fixed set of, of flavors, instance sizes, uh, different terminology depending on uh, what you're using. But in OpenStack, uh, you refer to them as flavors. We started out with, with quite large local um, VM uh, disks for, um, for these systems. And that uh, presented challenges and, and users wanted to, wanted to rely on that and, and keep it as a pet. They wanted to, you know, well, I'll stand up this VM and I'll put my stuff there and just let it run forever. That's, that's not the idea. You have, to work, you have to work outside of that. It also presents um, a lot of challenges when you're trying to pass around 400 gig uh, images, but you're only using 10, 20 gigs. So we have um, reduced the, uh, the size of those disks that we're, we're providing when an image is stood up. That doesn't mean you can't get more storage you can create and manage volume separately. That's what we encourage users to do. If you want a volume to persist and you can attach it, detach it from, from multiple VMs, that's where we're trying to, uh, uh, to direct people. We're charging, charging in the term of, of exceed service units, not in terms of dollars, uh, based on virtual CPU hours. We're trying to make that straightforward. These are just hyper-threaded, hyper-threaded cores on on Haswell processors. And we wanted to make the calculation very simple. So we can have a ton of flavors, um, 300 flavors, like if you look at Amazon's page, which makes it really hard to determine what's the best bet. For the community we're trying to target, we wanted to make it uh, uh, very straightforward. I'll just breeze through a, a couple of screenshots, and pass it off to you, to Mike. This is what the, the Interface looks like if you just go to uh, use.jetstream-cloud.org. Before you even log in, you can see the images, search the images, be able to say, well, what's, uh, what's there? You can, you can see there's various, uh, can't read it, but there's various tags, um, what instance size it requires. You know, one of the downsides of those larger Im instances, if you would image based on that large instance size, you would have to execute in that environment. Whereas if you image uh, a small VM with 10 gigs of, of root disk, you can run that on a much larger flavor. This is what you'll be presented with for, for login. We're um, uh, partners with uh, the Globus team based out of the University of Chicago and federate with lots of different authentication services like InCommon or even you can use your Google credentials to sign in first have to have an Exceed account in order to, uh, to get on the system. But if you already have that account, you can log in with um, other credentials. It'll present you, um, pre present you that authentication box, <coughs> or you have the option to create a new account if you don't have an Exceed account, and then it puts you into the Atmosphere interface. You'll be able to do tasks such as create a new, new VM, create a new project, see what resources you're using, where it's running at, if it's running in Texas, running in And the nice thing for those users is they're not going in having to configure their own networks, configure their, their own storage. You can do that all through, um, through this, uh, this interface. But if you, want, uh, if you want more access, if you want to dive in deeper as well. Then lastly, um, I always try to hit on this uh, HPC versus, versus cloud perspective because I come from the, the HPC side and it's, it's been a challenge for, for admins and myself to, to adapt to these different, different environments. To, to have the concept of not having a, a traditional scheduler, not doing reservations, um, having that interactive environment without, without batch queuing. And, and really, I think, as people come to this environment, the first thing they, they want is, where's my 
parallel file system? Where's my POSIX store? And uh, you, don't, you don't have that teaching the, the concepts of object storage is, and, and even, even local block storage is a challenge for these, uh, these users and even these, the administrators to say, this is different. Um, it's not what you had before. There's some great benefits to, to users being their own admins. Um, they, can, uh, they can really install whatever they want. And uh, they often find there's, there's dragons there. Um, you know, that's, that's, where the, that's where the challenges are, and, and uh, um, both on the user side and security side as well. Good morning. Uh, so, um, one does not simply install OpenStack. It is uh, is actually a, a collection of fifty six different projects. Last time, and a community to go along with that. And I'd like to take a moment to uh, to point out that uh, we have a. Uh, Inside of the community, we have a scientific working group. Our co-chairs is, is speaking later today, uh, Stig Telfer. And, um, it, uh, within the community, it functions uh, probably most similarly to the, uh, to the HPC XXL organization. We are an advocate for scientific use cases and try and help each other out. Um, So everybody, to get an orthogonal cloud, everybody installs the same basic five services. And these, um, these map to the same kinds of uh, structures that you learned when you were first learning about how a computer gets put together way back when. There's, there's instructions, there's data, there's something to process it. Um, it's mapped to, to all these services. So that's why you see such a high adoption rate for some of these. But then once you get past a working cloud, start up a VM and do some stuff, then the, the maturity drops off, the adoption rate drops off, and the development cycle picks up. Uh, and so I'd like to touch on a couple of these things uh, a bit later. But, uh, these, um, these are all services that we are, we are currently with the exception of Ironic, we are going to, we are either in process of deploying or have plans to deploy. And uh, as Dave said, this is not an HPC system. So, you know, I come from an engineering background. Of, uh, there's always the concept of trade-offs. So what, what we're trading here is some performance for for flexibility. Um, everybody here takes a maintenance day. An HPC system, it goes down once a month. Um, Jetstream has never taken a planned maintenance yet. We've had downtime, that's, uh, that's for sure. Bulldozers, my, my many mistakes, things like that, things we didn't know. This is a first of a kind system for both us and the National Science Foundation, so nobody's quite written the book yet as part of the working group. We are actually sort of writing that book. But um, what that means is uh, we need to build this much more like an enterprise cloud since there's no concept of a job that ends. There's no, there's no gap in service. Uh, so we're going to have to build a, an HA system. And so that's what we did. So we used HA proxy front end, fronts for all of the different services. We have a three-way uh, active, active controllers that run all the services in turn. We terminate our SSL on the outside. We're not, uh, we're not set up sensitive private data. We lack some of those constraints on the inside. Not, not every cloud is able to We have, we run our uh, load balancers also in an HA because you only have one load balancer and it goes down. What's the point? 
Hearts are backed up. Keep alive. There's a, a DNS round robin, so rough DNS load balancing to the load balancer. And if one of those goes down, and it picks up the other guy's IP, we just keep going. Our recovery time is about five seconds. If I go and take one of those out of service, it's back to about five seconds. And so far, I haven't had any complaints. All the OpenStack services are, are built in a RESTful pattern. These controllers don't actually have any state themselves. So I kill one, but it does mean I have to have a highly available backend to store the state of the system. And so we use uh, MySQL, Valera, a very common pattern. Split that across a couple of tracks. So at, at this point, um, we were able to walk up and kill any node, any rack, and we pick up and keep running. And, uh, as, as Dave alluded to, we have a Ceph cluster backing this. Not familiar with Ceph. It's a, it's a software defined rich network storage. And it's self healing. Use two and three way replication to storage you're accessing. So it's, uh, it's copy on write. The, uh, the concept is for, for storage for a VM, it's very simple. It's just a, uh, you just map your regular 500 blocks into, a, into an object and offset. It's uh, conceptually very simple. But, um, sure, yeah. Yes, okay. So uh, all rights to Ceph, are, every the metadata and data in Ceph is journal. Um, and, uh, it does mean you pay a double write penalty. How we to alleviate that, we use SSDs at the front for the journals, and then you know, that allows us to soak up first writes. So we can, we can do, it's around uh, two gigabytes a second in a sustained write cluster. It's uh, 140 OSDs. Okay. I love getting questions during it. Um, okay. Uh, right. So the interaction here, um, user will go off and grab a grab a token, and that that token lets them talk to all the other services. They're all independent, autonomous, and talks amongst themselves. So you, you use this token and pass it around. Um, you ask no to boot, it goes off to glance, and looks up metadata. Glance, in this configuration, uh, only actually contains metadata. It points back to the Ceph cluster. And it passes that metadata off to sender, and sender, the block, sender block. We'll take that metadata clone based on the location we received glance, and then uh, once that has been cloned, which is a very inexpensive operation, very quick, we'll go instruct its compute agent to fire up a VM backed by that. And what that, what that gets us is we have boot times of, from the time you ask, you ask Keystone for your token to the, to the time you can actually SSH in, that's eight to 12 seconds. That gives us some interesting capabilities in terms of Use disposable. It's not, uh, it's not the five or ten minute boot time that, that you'd see on some other clouds, which means you can fire one up, run it for two minutes, and tear it down. On another cloud, you may still not have boot. So that gives our users some interesting capabilities in terms of uh, very short, bursty type things they can can respond very quickly to the demands. The, so the networking, we 
chose was a little bit unusual at the time. It's becoming more mainstream. We chose VXLAN to fully encapsulate all the Layer 2 network. The Intel X710 Linux, and they have a VXLAN offload engine, which has worked fairly well for us. Um, so when we, um, if you, and today, if you use SRIOV, PK alluded very quickly in like three seconds in one of his slides that SRIOV uh, enabled live migration is in the works, but we're building the system. If you were to pick some of the faster, lower latency network systems, you had to give up live migration, which broke our plans for maintaining the system. So we backed off that requirement. And what it wound up costing us was about uh, so 9.9 .9 bare metal hypervisor, hypervisor, and 9.8 uh, gigs a second VM to VM. Uh, this is sort of a logical diagram of how this kind of works. You emulate broadcast with broadcast, channels as you cast UDP packets. We have uh, we have five network nodes, uh, one for each rack. Our uplink is a gig. We have uh, two by ten links, and it works out to that we can roughly fill pipes give or take. So, way back when, uh, 18 months ago, years ago, uh, Solometer had a very bad reputation. It's the, it's the telemetry service. If you, uh, if you fired this thing up, you collected metrics and events, time series data, all in one bundle, one service, and Lorantist modest size cloud testing this out. It was generating tens of terabytes a day worth of telemetry data, which is just unsustainable. So most people just skip this. And uh, developers, um, Chris Dent, Ren Chang, a couple others, they decided that they need to evolve these functions out into their own services. And that's right about where we are. They left Solometer alone, and it still collects all the data across uh, message buses. And brings that into the other services to be used. Nokia is a time series database. And this, is, this one has been interesting and very challenging. Um, if you collect 30 or so metrics for systems, you have several hundred of these, you have several nodes that each have two or three dozen metrics, you wind up with something on the order of a billion measurements a month, which is sort of, and those are, um, those originally were not aggregated. So if you're trying to aggregate, run a report across a billion points, you're still doing this. You're not doing this with the HPC, an HPC style system. This is your this is your management stuff. This is you know this is the one or two nodes that you have left over to run the system. It's not. If you were to actually process this, you'd wind up Ouroboros. You know the <laughs> you'd need a cloud the size of your cloud to process the data coming from your cloud. So they did a couple of clever things. One, they. Uh, Records from the original Solometer were, uh, they contained all of the metadata about the measurement. And so every record was several K. Naive assumption was when you have a lot of data, you put it in. They noticed that Ceph was very common, was at least as performant, and should be fairly, uh, fairly large, a fairly large deployment for cloud. So they, wrote a Ceph backend, so all the measurements go into Ceph. Uh, and they split out the metadata, so the metadata is separate, separate the metadata. So that gets your records down to nine bytes versus several. So that saves an enormous amount of. They also do the aggregation 
at the at the time of ingestion. Can run can run six months. Uh, you can run six months worth of twenty seconds versus hours and hours for the old system. Split out the alarm system. Installing the alarm system allows you to have some automated smart. This will feed back into other systems, and give you a feedback path so that your applications can respond to the current state of the cloud. The, uh, the event storage is, is relatively straightforward. Action on the cloud generates an event. In our case, uh, which I don't know that anybody else does this, to report what would be normal HPC jobs, there are uh, there are events generated every hour that say a VM exists. So we sort of coerce those a job-like record and submit those to our agency based on the events generated from the system. So. Uh, most recent things I've been up some of these orchestration pieces. This is this is where the real power of is to take away the things that your users are interested in and give them quick cuts. This is the orchestration engine. It talks to all the other services. It does stuff. Give it a big template and it executes it and lets you know when it's when it's done. Uh, and then there are higher order services like Magnum, uh, Sahara, which deploy, which turn around and generate heat templates or uh, Docker swarms or Kubernetes or flavors of a, whoop, Hadoop. Um, so I, uh, most recently we had, uh, we had a guy who wanted to, um, he wanted a, uh, cluster for a class, and he gave us uh, four days to build an image and get it running. If I had this ready, this is when I decided to deploy this, if I had this ready, I could have serviced him in you know, 10 minutes. Uh, instead, he, he spent you know, several days building up image with Hadoop. Uh, so we've done, we've done two upgrades so far. Since September, the um, the release cycle for OpenStack is kind of brutal. It's uh, it's every six months. If, uh, we'd lose our minds if Red Hat came out with a new release every six months. But uh, but OpenStack does it, and you really have to keep up. So this is where we leverage our our HA. We'll take one of the controllers out, upgrade its bits use those upgraded bits with their new uh, database migrations, apply those migrations. They usually come in two, two phases, so there's a transitional phase. And so we'll get the transitional one up, run on the old bits, and we'll, do, uh, we'll bring the new bits up. Um, most of the core services, they can survive a hybrid, the new in a way, and then we'll take down the old ones, the new bits, we'll bring those all the way, we'll bring the database migrations all the way up to the latest. Upgrade the, uh, upgrade the remaining controllers, bring them online, and we're back to full capacity. And we have just, uh, just a minute left, um, but just to talk about what, what comes next. Um, as I said, we're almost at a, at the end of our, our year one operations. We have a lot of focus in, in outreach and increasing, uh, trying to increase the, the personnel to um, really get into the, the domain science communities. Um, we're continually accepting research allocations, um, startup allocations. You can, um, you can request those, uh, those resources through the traditional exceed processes. Um, our, our team at uh, at Arizona is constantly adding features and enhancements to uh, to Atmosphere. Um, 
So to be able to, to have dynamic tools to install, um, install software on running instances is something they're, they're adding. Um, an atmosphere command line interface, kind of like the OpenStack CLI, um, a command line interface for uh, that user portal. More, uh, more project sharing. Um, things like you can already run your Jupyter notebooks and um, things like that, but being able to integrate those a little better into, uh, into the front end. And um, we're also hoping to bring kind of above the cloud image management in terms of uh, repository, as you think about orchestration, like Mike talked about with Heat, to be able to say, here's what I need to, to orchestrate and provision in, in DevOps style. Um, something on this environment that also works on, on other environments, making it more uh, independent. And uh, if you want to request access, um, you, can, you can do a do this startup usually within 24, 48 hours. Um, same with the educational allocation. Uh, the next submission for large research allocations, if you know someone who's interested, um, ends uh, in just, uh, uh, just a few days. And we're happy to help people prepare this. Um, you don't have to have used the system before to request an allocation. You do need a US-based collaborator. So that's the only, uh, the only caveat. But most, uh, uh, most research groups, because it's so collaborative, um, already have that today. And these are all um, these are all the partners and uh, that have helped us uh, on the project, both funded and unfunded. And uh, we couldn't have done it with uh, without this team. So there's your links and various uh, documentation, and we'll open it up for uh, just maybe uh, maybe a question or two, and we'll be, uh, be available at the break. Well, so um, because uh, uh, the question was, uh, uh, we don't handle secure or sensitive data. Do we want to elaborate that on, on that a bit? So at, at Indiana, with such a large medical presence, clinical treatment uh, pipeline, there's higher levels of data classification, um, electronic protected health information, and critical data. Uh, those are not being served out of this environment. We've not. We've not certified the system for that type of uh, of data. There's a there's a long and, and in depth compliance process, auditing process that we have to go through to do that. So it's really meant for open science research. It's not that the environment's not secure, but like Mike said, you're coming in with uh, with SSL, and then on the back end underneath, not necessarily everything's encrypted. It'd be no different than your HPC system as well. You're not encrypting all the way. Device. So you do different things if uh, you're handling the critical data, at least at our, at our institute. Knowing what you know now, how would you have done it differently? Oh, where to start? Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess starting with the deployment, there is a relatively new project that didn't exist Cola, and it is running OpenStack services inside of containers. You know, the dependency tree for these services is vast. It, is, um, it rivals, you know, H all the uh, all the really complex HPC codes. And it's extremely easy to 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 break a minor dependency, you know, six layers down, and then you'll never find. It. So, um, taking a real hard look at uh, using cola and containers would have been the first thing I would have done. You know, I, I picked, I picked the, uh, I picked the wrong networking technology. There are two modes for VXLAN. One is unicast, one is multicast. The unicast just didn't scale for us, so we had to rip that out and go with multicast. I don't know. I mean. <laughs> Boy, uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a lot of lessons learned. You every uh, one of the more interesting things that we learned is we have two two completely distinct clouds. One at one at a 
Indiana and one in Texas. And despite our best efforts to make those exactly the same, they were just little, tiny little things. And you know, within a complex system, small differences come out in you know emergent behavior that is distinctly different. So it's it's one of those really interesting things where just a few minor config changes can really have a large, large impact in the way the system actually behaves. So. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we won't take uh, any more any more time. If you guys have questions, uh, hit us up later. Um, and thanks for uh, thanks for having us.